Who are connecting to the cloud server. Uh, oh, there's great. like a little red dot when I talk. So I think that means yes. I'm being recorded. Awesome. <laughs> great. Okay, it's back on. So, okay, so um, anyways, yeah, it's a, it's a pleasure to introduce Joe Nelson and Morgan Weiler. Um, and they're going to tell us about ECH of pre quantization bundles and lens spaces. So take it away. All right. Well, thanks so much for the invitation. When I was first invited, I thought that no way would I be able to give two talks in the span of two weeks, but I've successfully written slides with Morgan for the first talk, so I hope that the second talk will also be ready. Okay, so I first wanted to start off um, with the definition of what a context structure is. So that's going to be a ma maximally non-integrable hyperplane field, which means that you don't have a co-dimension one foliation. And um, as an example, here's a picture of the kernel of dz minus y dx in the z equals zero plane. And then as y, when y is zero, you can see that um, you have an array of flat planes. And then as you increase y, you have this twisting. And you could imagine here that you couldn't, you could find co-dimension two submanifolds, so dimension one submanifolds, but you couldn't find a two-dimensional surface whose tangent planes um, would give you this uh, kernel of this form. And then to further illustrate that, here's four stacks of these um, planes in z equals zero, one, two, three, four. And you can probably maybe a little bit more convincingly say that um, this is maximally non-integrable. So the way that you can actually check if a context structure is maximally non-integrable is uh, if you look at the kernel of a one form, that's going to be a context structure whenever lambda wedge d lambda to the n minus one is a volume form. And that's going to be equivalent to saying that d lambda restricted to its kernel is non-degenerate. So the next thing that we're going to be interested in discussing is ray vector fields and more specifically periodic orbits of ray vector fields. So the ray vector field is the analog of a Hamiltonian vector field in the context geometry. And it is uniquely determined by the equations lambda of r is one. So that's a sort of normalization condition. And then there's going to be exactly sort of one dimension in which um, d lambda is degenerate. And that's going to be in the r direction. And so then if we sit down and remember some formulas from differential geometry, that actually, that last um, equation tells us that the contact planes are invariant under the flow of r. And as kind of a simple example, if we go back to kernel dz minus y dx, well, if we want um, lambda of r to be 1, we're going to need to use ddz. And ddz is also going to be what um, makes d lambda vanish when we contract it. And then the flow of the ray vector field is just going to be um, going upwards in the z direction with time. Okay. So the ray flow is just, you want the time derivative to be equal to R of the flow, and then a closed ray orbit, everything's going to be done uh, modulo reparametrization. So we just care about the image and Y. So that's going to be a map from R mod TZ, where T is the period, and it's going to be positive. And then if it's a closed ray orbit, we want gamma dot to be equal to R of gamma, and we want um, gamma of zero to be the same as gamma of T. And then we say that this ray orbit is embedded whenever this map is injective. And that's also equivalent to the use of uh, simple, um, but due to different nomenclature in embedded contact homology, we prefer the term embedded because that sounds a little bit more exciting than simple contact homology, I think. OK, so um, given an embedded ray orbit, we're going to look at the linearized um, return map that's associated to the orbit. And that's a symplectic linear map that we get by restricting D of the flow to the contact hyperplanes. And then that gives us, um, for T between zero and big T, that gives us an arc of symplectic matrices. And then if we look at time big T, which is our period, we can um, look at the eigenvalues of that map. And if one is not an eigenvalue of that map, then we say that gamma is non-degenerate. And we know that non-degenerate orbits are either going to be elliptic or hyperbolic. This is in the dimension three setting. Um, and that is according to whether or not um, you have eigenvalues on S1, in which case you'd be elliptic. And if you have real eigenvalues, they'll come in a pair um, 
usually use lambda, but I guess E and one over E would be your eigenvalues. And um, if they're negative real numbers, you say it's negative hyperbolic. And if they're positive real numbers, you say they're positive hyperbolic. Um, and if they're just real, you can just say that they're hyperbolic. And then we say that the contact form is non-degenerate if all the rabe orbits associated to the rabe vector field um, defined by lambda are non-degenerate. And we're going to be concerned with coming up with um, non-degenerate contact forms when we sit down and try to compute ECH of a particular manifold. So as an example of a contact manifold, which is not R3, we've got the unit sphere. So that um, I have described as sitting inside of C2 is norm u squared plus norm v squared equals one. The canonical contact form just comes from the primitive of the fubini studi form on CN. So that's that equation. And then um, it turns out the orbits of the ray vector field defined by this uh, contact form give you the Hopf vibration. And this follows from a computation, which takes like two days if you're a grad student and like 30 minutes if you're having a good math day. And um, you end up with the flow being e to the ITU, e to the ITV. And if you sit down and spend a bunch of time on the Wikipedia article about the hop vibration, you can actually convince yourself that that is um, describing the hop vibration. So Patrick Masseau has a really nice um, illustration of sort of the hop flow with array of contact planes and then there's kind of an inverse stereographic projection thing going on since we normally can't visualize S3. Um, and then Niles Johnson is not a contact geometer but he is a geometer topologist person and he's very good at magma and so he figured out how to program in magma a visualization of S3 um, using the hop vibration. And so the points um, on S2, the colors correspond to the circle color of the fiber. And um, the ray vector field that I had previously described on R3 is pretty boring. And already it's pretty exciting on S3. And Niles actually made a YouTube video um, kind of showing you how the fibers change as you move around the base. And so that gives us like the best approximation to actually seeing a ray flow. So, um, great, okay, so right now the animation starts off a little bit slow. Over every point you have a circle, every circle links with every other circle exactly once. Um, I know that I was not a gifted enough topologist to believe that you could form S3 by gluing two solid tori along their common boundary. But when I watched this video, I was immediately convinced because um, over the northern hemisphere, you'll get a solid torus. Over the southern hemisphere, you get a solid torus. And then along the equator, you get their boundary of both tori. And so that's kind of a cool thing to pay attention to. At the North Pole, you've got the point at infinity. And so that's why you see a line rather than a circle. And um, when Morgan and I were running through our talk yesterday, she pointed out to me that you could actually kind of see pseudo-holomorphic curves in a certain sense because um, we're gonna be looking at sort of Morse flow lines on the base. So when we start to see an arc on the base that looks like it could connect the North Pole to the South Pole, upstairs we'll see something that roughly looks like a J holomorphic curve. Um, and then another thing that's pretty cool is that um, later on we'll sort of have a Hamiltonian function that we're gonna put on the base and then the perturbed rabe vector field can be expressed in terms of the um, original rabe vector field, which is gonna be the vibration, plus a term coming from lifts of the um, Hamiltonian on the base. And so on the base, if you have a closed orbit, if you look upstairs, that corresponds to some torus. And so you could have a really long orbit kind of winding around this torus upstairs. And then Niles Johnson demonstrated how awesome he is at sort of programming at this stage in the animation. And so we can just kind of uh, look at how awesome S3 is. And when I showed this to Josh Shabloff, he was like, wow, this is amazing, Joe. I don't have to draw the hop vibration in real time anymore. So um, I've never been that talented, but I was very grateful when I discovered that someone had programmed the hop vibration. And there's really terrible music. So if you do watch this, just be careful. It's set to the music of the Mandelbrot set. And um, it usually plays like really loud as soon as you start the video. And here's kind of 
a nice visualization of what the sort of rave flow looks like on S3 um, as parametrized by um, arcs on S2. It's really mesmerizing. Okay. So um, the hop vibration is an example of a more general um, construction, which is known as a pre-quantization bundle. And pre-quantization bundles are defined in any dimension, but ECH is, um, we only know how to compute, or we only know how to even define ECH for three manifolds. It's something very special about three manifolds because it's related to cyber witten theory. And um, so for us, our base is gonna be a Riemann surface, a closed Riemann surface but it could be more generally any um, symplectic, closed symplectic manifold. Maybe if you're doing some kind of FLIR theory, you would want that base to be monotone. Um, but for us, we can just take any Riemann, closed Riemann surface we want, and omega is just any um, area form on that guy. So it's a symplectic form. And then E is gonna be a negative class in H2. And then the pre-quantization bundle is the principal S1 bundle over this Riemann surface or base that has Euler class E. And so um, this, if you take the base to be S2, depending on what Euler class you pick, you'll either get um, S3 or you can get lens spaces. So we'll see that um, a little bit later on in our slides. And basically what's happening with this pre-quantization bundle is that we have a principal S1 bundle and Boothby and Wang, um, among other things, realized that there was gonna be a connection one form on this bundle whose rave vector field is actually tangent to the S1 action. And because of the connection one form, that tells us that the um, pullback of omega is gonna be equal to D lambda. And so we have this really nice interplay between sort of the symplectic um, topology or the symplectic geometry of the base and then, of the, and then the rave dynamics of the actual bundle. And we'll make use of this later on when we're trying to actually um, compute the embedded contact homology differential. So this bundle is called the pre-quantization bundle over the base. Um, the rave orbits of R are gonna be the S1 fibers of this bundle when we use the connection one form lambda as our contact form. Um, the rave orbits of R are all degenerate. There are, nowhere, there are no isolated orbits. So that's one way to see that it's degenerate. You can also go back to the hot vibration slide and do the computation and see that you're gonna get one as an eigenvalue. And then we have that D lambda is the pullback of omega. And we have that the push forward of the contact distribution is actually equal to the tangent bundle of um, the uh, Riemann surface. And normally when we do these contact homology theories, we want to work with a non-degenerate contact form. So in the next slide, we're going to see how to use a more smale function to perturb lambda. And so we get a new contact form by just doing one plus a small lift of this uh, Morse function base. I'm saying the word Morse smale because you can use the um, symplectic form to define a metric on the base, and then you would want it to be smale with respect to the sort of canonically defined metric coming from a, um, the symplectic form on the base in a compatible, um, almost complex structure. And then uh, computation reveals that the rave vector field associated to this perturbed um, contact form is given in terms of um, a component of the sort of original uh, vector field that's this R. So um, R is the derivative of the S1 uh, vibration on our bundle. And then we have an additional term that can um, that arises from the horizontal lift of the Hamiltonian vector field on the base, which we can lift up. Um, under our bundle map. And if P is a critical point of H, then we know that XH of P is zero. So this term here dies off. And then that tells us that over a critical point, the Rabe orbits up to sort of a rescaling are gonna agree with the original fibers of the base. And then if we put a Morse function on our base, it's gonna have isolated critical points. And so that tells us that the fibers of the bundle that persist as Rabe orbits are going to be isolated. And then we might have some additional um, orbits that come from lifts of closed orbits on the base, but it, we're gonna set up an action filtration that's gonna allow us to basically ignore those orbits. So the action of a orbit is just given by integrating your contact form along the orbit. And then um, the claim is that 
if you fix some um, action number greater than zero, there's always going to be some epsilon greater than zero so that if you have an orbit of your perturbed wave vector field, if the action is less than L, then um, gamma is going to be non-degenerate and projects to a critical point. So it could be an iterate of a fiber, um, but it will be like an iterate up to basically L over two pi or kind of however you're normalizing your bundle. And then if the action is greater than L, um, it will be the case that the, the corresponding orbits either have to loop around tori, which exist above the orbits of the Hamiltonian vector field on the base, or it needs to be a larger iterate of a fiber above the critical point. And so the idea is that with this filtration, we only want to have sort of understandable orbits. So we're always going to be picking an epsilon to ensure that we don't see any of these looping tori-like orbits and that they're all going to be iterates of fibers in the base. Okay, and then um, I just want to say a few words about sort of conley zander indices and classifying the fiber orbits because that's going to come up later when we define the chain complex. So here's our perturbed rate vector field. We're going to denote the uh, cover of a fiber which projects to a critical point, which is going to be a periodic rave orbit of this perturbed rate vector field by gamma sub pk. And then um, we have a formula for the conley zander index in terms of the robbins alamon index of the fiber. So there's kind of a complicated way, it's maybe not super complicated, but there's kind of a multi-step procedure to actually computing the conley zander index. And there's sort of the abstract definition, but that would require you to have a non-degenerate um, rabe orbit. And that can be pretty hard to compute because you do it in terms of sort of intersection cycles. So you want to use the robin Zolomon framework of um, crossing forms where you can readily compute things. And moreover, if you um, use the degenerate um, connection one form that allows you to compute the robin Zolomon index of the fiber very easily. And then um, you can show that because of the addition of this uh, Hamiltonian um, or because of this addition of the more smale function on the base, that's going to contribute an extra sort of correction term at time zero when you look at the crossing form contribution, and that's expressed as minus half the dimension of the base plus the Morse index. And Otto van Kurt has some really beautiful notes on his website where he explains all of this in sort of gory detail, but it's amazing because it's this sort of like folk computation that everyone just kind of says is obvious, but it requires a bit of work to actually see. And then um, what's going to be kind of different in the realm of embedded contact homology from other sort of symplectic homology and cylindrical contact homology and all that is that rather than using a trivialization which spans a disk, and in that case, the robin Zalman contribution um, of the fiber would be 4K for the sphere. Um, we're going to be using kind of like a stupid, well, it's not a stupid trivialization. It's a very intelligent trivialization because it makes these computations very easily, very easy. But as a result, it's going to give us that the robin Zalaman index of the fiber is equal to zero. And that's going to be really crucial. Um, well, we're not going to actually go into the details of how you compute the ECH index. But if you actually want to compute the ECH index, then you, it, you're much better off using a constant trivialization. And then um, using this constant trivialization, we get this nice closed form expression for the conley zander index. And we're just going to get that it's um, the Morse index of critical point minus one because the dimension of the base is two. So since we have this formula for the conley zander index and we're working in dimension three, we can sort of remember facts about positive hyperbolic, negative hyperbolic, and elliptic orbits. And we know that only positive hyperbolic orbits can have even conley zander index. So normally you would compute the linearized return map and hunt for eigenvalues, but that is a lot less easy to explain in a short period of time. So we're just going to go off of facts on the conley zander index, even though that's typically not how you characterize whether or not an orbit is hyperbolic or elliptic. And so if the index of our point is, uh, if the Morse index is one, then we have one minus one, which is zero. And zero is an even integer. And every time we iterate, we just continue to be zero. And so that's telling us that our um, orbit is positive hyperbolic. And then since um, we are working with this bundle, all linearized return maps are going to be close to the identity. So that tells us that there's no negative hyperbolic orbits. 
you can see that alternatively too in terms of just explicitly looking at the linearized return map. And then if we look at Morse index zero or two, we're gonna get an odd conley zander index and because there can't be any negative hyperbolic orbits that tells us that our orbit is elliptic. And it would also make sense that our orbit would be elliptic rather than hyperbolic because hyperbolic needs to go up uniformly every time you iterate. And for a negative hyperbolic, you always increase by an odd um, integer and it has to be the same integer always. And so it'd be really weird if these were um, negative hyperbolic orbits because you'd be always stuck at conley zander index minus one or always stuck at conley zander index one. So that's kind of another way of thinking about um, the relationship between the conley zander index and sort of hyperbolic orbits and elliptic orbits. So if we have a perfect Morse function, which basically just means that it's kind of picking up exactly the right amount um, of information for the chain complex, there's sort of no extra index one points, then um, we'll denote the index zero elliptic orbit by E minus, the index two elliptic orbit by E plus, so E is for elliptic. And then um, depending on the genus of our base, we're going to end up having 2G um, index one critical points, and those are gonna be hyperbolic orbits, and we denote those by H1 up to H2G. And now um, Morgan's gonna take it away and tell us a bit about embedded contact homology. Yeah, so uh, embedded contact homology is a FLIR homology theory for closed three, contact three manifolds. And, um, and also a choice of first homology class, so you can do this for any first homology class. And, oh, Joe, can you oh, go? Sorry. To sorry. <laughs> I was like looking for your video and, okay, great. Yeah, um, thanks. So uh, it turns out that, as we'll say in a few slides, um, ECH on the homology level doesn't depend very much on the choice of contact form. Um, but the way that you construct the chain complex relies on a non-degenerate contact form. So, um, and the chain complex is called ECC Y lambda gamma J, and I'll explain the J on the next slide. So um, the generators are called orbit sets, and these are finite sets of pairs where the first element in the pair is an embedded ray orbit, and the second element is some positive integer. And the total homology class of an orbit set, the third bullet, uh, what the third bullet point says is gamma. And there's a fourth requirement, which is that if alpha i is hyperbolic, then the multiplicity of the hyperbolic orbit can be, can be one or it just will not show up at all. Um, and then the coefficients, so we're using Z mod two in applications so far, uh, Z mod two is all anyone has ever needed. Um, it's possible to do everything over Z. Uh, this, the grading comes from the relative ECH index. So the ECH index, you plug in, um, two orbit sets, and then you should also be plugging in a relative homology class between those orbit sets. In the case of pre-quantization bundles, the ECH index doesn't depend on anything besides the two orbit sets on either side. Um, so that's the notation we're going to use here. And the ECH index is a combination of the first churn class of the contact structure, the conley zander indices of the ends, and this relative self-intersection term, which has to do with basically the topology of what curves could interpolate between alpha and beta. Um, so what are those curves and how do they, what do they have to do with the differential? So we say that um, an almost complex structure on R cross Y is lambda compatible um, if it satisfies the following conditions. So if it's R invariant, if it rotates the contact structure positively with respect to D lambda, and if it sends the R direction to the rave direction. And uh, we're going to use J to um, determine the curves that we are going to count to get the ECH differential. So the coefficient of beta in the um, ECH differential of alpha is a, a mod two count of currents, which are disjoint unions of J holomorphic curves um, from a punctured Riemann surface to R cross Y. And so J holomorphic just means they satisfy this Cauchy Riemann equation. And if um, U realizes some part of the differential, between alpha and beta, then we require that U is asymptotically cylindrical to the orbit sets alpha and beta at plus and minus infinity. So we have a little doodle of what that would look like. Um, and so the point of the ECH index, well, maybe there are a lot of points, but one thing that you might be worried about is that this count is finite 
and um, that you know you can actually get your hands on the space of these currents. And so the fact that um, so so what we're we're going to do is restrict to sort of the dimension one part of um, the moduli space of such currents between alpha and beta, and that's going to coincide with the ECH index one when alpha and beta have, have ECH index um, difference one. And that, and that was encapsulated in the in the little haiku. Um, so uh, so once we have this differential, Hutchings and Tobbs proved that it squares to zero. So in fact, we do have a chain complex. And many people proved that the homology doesn't depend on J and that it doesn't depend on the contact form, just on actually just on the first Chern class of the contact structure. Um, and so we're going to denote the homology by the ECH of Y kernel lambda gamma. Um, the way in which the, this invariance result was proved is by isomorphisms with cyber witten floor homology and Haggard floor homology, which are smooth invariants. Um, and so this haiku tells you that d squared is zero. Um, and uh, proving all the theorems on this slide took many people many, many pages. So our theorem. Um, which is in progress, is uh, if you have a pre-quantization bundle over Riemann surface, then if you add up all of the ECHs, um, oh, okay, so invariance, oh, okay, so invariance is maybe earlier than the isomorphisms. If you just want invariance, maybe earlier than the isomorphisms with the other um, homologies. Well, anyway, a lot of people did a lot of work that we referenced on the other slides, and one corollary maybe is this is invariance um, and it was proved by several people. Oh, okay. Okay, maybe I didn't read enough of your papers. Um, okay, so. We just wanted to give everyone credit so that no one was sad during our talk, but maybe we should have just said Taubes and left it at that. Um, okay, so if we have a pre-quantization bundle and you you take the direct sum over all first homology classes of Y of the ECHs of um, this pre-quantization bundle. <laughs> um, then it's isomorphic as a Z mod two module. Well, so a Z mod two graded module um, to the exterior algebra of the homology of the base. So with Z mod two coefficients. So there's something kind of confusing going on here. Um, the coefficients are Z mod two, and we're happy with that. Um, this isomorphism was writ first um, appeared in the 2011 PhD thesis of Ferris, and the the gradings. So so there's the coefficients. That's one thing, and then there's also the gradings on both sides, and the gradings match as Z mod two gradings, but they don't match as um, Z gradings. So we'll get into that in a few slides. So I'll just explain sort of what's going on here and why you should believe this. So on the right-hand side, the critical points of a perfect Morse function form a basis for the homology um, of the base. And as Joe explained to us, the generators of ECH are of the form E minus to the M minus, HI to the MI, and E plus to the M plus. Um, and here, when we write ECH orbit sets in multiplicative notation, we allow the exponents to be zero. So um, the M plus and minus can be any non-negative integer and the MIs can be zero or one. And so that's, those exactly correspond to a basis for the exterior algebra on the right-hand side. Remember, you're um, also taking the zeroth exterior product. Um, so the empty set does appear on the right-hand side. And um, so what we're going to explain is that the ECH differential is only going to count cylinders in, um, in R cross Y, where when you project them down to Y and then project them down to the base, they live above a Morse flow line of, um, of H. And so therefore you can interpret the ECH differential of this generator as exactly what the um, differential on the right-hand side would be. It's the sum over all the different ways to apply the Morse differential to one of the terms multiplied by all the terms that you just left behind, well, multiplied. Um, yeah, so next we have some examples. Okay, so our favorite friend, S3. So um, as has been known for a while, uh, the ECH of S3 is, is uh, Z mod 2 in every non-negative 
um, integer, uh, even integer grading. And it's generated by terms e minus to the m minus, e plus to the m plus, the grading of e minus is two, the grading of e plus is four. And here's a, a, the first example where a star, I mean, it's, I think it's true for every example, um, but star is not the grading on the exterior algebra because uh, the grading of e minus squared is six, not four. And you can see in the picture, um, if you choose the height function on S2 as your perturbation H, then the fibers above the minimum and the maximum represent uh, E plus and E minus. And here the Morse differential is zero. There's no index one critical points. So the ECH um, it differential is also zero. Does this, oh, and this also, yeah, this also corresponds to the irrational ellipsoid computation. Mm -hmm. It's just kind of two different ways of computing the same ECH. Yeah, I mean, with the irrational ellipsoid, I mean, I think Vinicius knows this because I talked to him about it, but uh, you have to be a little bit careful because the ellipsoid's obviously not like exactly the same as S3, but yeah, it, it should correspond. Um, so, um, so we can generalize this to lens spaces. So if we take the Euler number minus K, then we get LK1. So for example, if we took Euler number one, um, bundle over S2, we would get S3, L11. Um, so a corollary of our theorem is that, well, sort of part of the theorem for genus, uh, genus zero base is that um, the ECH of these lens bases is Z mod two if the grading is um, a non-negative even integer and zero otherwise um, in any H1 class. And the reason why this is 95%, um, Yes, yeah, ellipsoid very close to spherical, yeah. Um, so the reason why this is 95% proved, um, where, while the main theorem is 90% proved, is that there's a step that is um, not required. Well, so you, have to, you have to do something slightly different uh, when you have a genus, a positive genus base, than when you have a negative genus, or a, sorry, a zero genus base. Um, some of the techniques the techniques for um, transversality don't work for genus zero, but the, the situation is a lot simpler and the geometry is a lot simpler, so you can just prove the theorem directly. Okay, so um, now I'm going to just say a few words about uh, a little bit more about how this isomorphism looks beyond just its Z mod two grading. So in a, if you've chosen a, ne a negative Euler class, um, then we're going to abuse notation. So gamma um, is a first homology class. Ray orbits uh, can never be, can never arise solely from first homology classes that sort of correspond to first homology classes in the base because we have a perturbation of a bundle. Um, and so they are either, if you, if you look at the, the first homology, if you compute the first homology of, um, of a circle bundle, you um, get that it, it, con it consists of uh, classes from the base and then iterates of the fiber up to the Euler number minus one. Um, or so in this case, it's negative Euler number minus one. So, so we're gonna just think of gamma as an element of Z mod minus E. And then um, the ECH is the sum for, for a specific gamma is the sum over all um, non-negative integers N of the, exterior product gamma minus NE times of the homology of the base. And um, so just to give you a sense of what goes into the index computations, if you have two orbit sets, um, and then you, you can see here uh, how you can compute the index. And you can see in this formula that the index only depends on the, the orbit sets on the ends. Um, so this, this little m is sort of the difference in the total number of um, orbits you're looking at at the top and the bottom divided by the negative Euler class, which has to be an integer because um, you are in the class gamma. So is, or because alpha and beta have to be in the same first homology class essentially. So yeah, so index computation, if you plug in e plus to the n plus e, um, as alpha and e minus to the n as beta, then you get that the index difference is 2g minus 2, if you look at this formula. And so we just gave you the formula again on this slide. So here's just an example of how um, the ECH splits based on the degree of 
exterior product you're taking. So in this table, we are looking at the ECH of Y, where the base is genus two, the Euler number is minus one, and um, the uh, and so we're and then we're looking at the um, exterior products zero through four and ECH index um, negative two through four, where the star basically is just the, the diff index difference between um, the generator and the empty set. And so you can see here that, um, for example, the empty set is E plus to the uh, one minus one. And then, so that gives you the empty set at um, grading zero and then at grading minus two, which in this case is two times two, uh, minus two times two minus two, uh, you get E minus. And similarly, um, E minus squared is sort of two behind E plus, E minus cubed is two behind E plus squared. So you can kind of see how they stack up and, and split along the Z grading. Oh, wait, sorry. Okay. So now I'm gonna switch to say some fun words about transversality, domain dependent, almost complex structures and abstraction bundle gluing. So, depending on how time is going, we'll hear more or less about that. So um, the theorem again that we're proving is this correspondence between embedded contact homology and um, the exterior um, algebra of the homology of the base. And um, sort of the steps of our proof are first, um, that was kind of a pre-step, I mean, I guess it's step zero, is that there exists an epsilon greater than zero so that the generators of the filtered ECH um, complex consists solely of orbits, which are fibers over critical points. And then the next step is gonna be proving that the, the differential up to this filtration level only counts cylinders, which are the union of fibers over Morse flow lines um, in the base. And so that's primarily what the next couple slides will be about. And then um, I'll switch back to Morgan and she'll explain a bit about the direct limit argument, um, which allows you to send epsilon to zero and get L going to infinity so that you recover all of ECH without having to do, um, sorry, I'm like looking at the chat at the same time, without having to appeal to a more spot ECH. So Muhammad asks, the right-hand side is an algebra. Is there an algebra structure on the left? If you have time, is there a bigrading on both sides of your isomorphisms that might allow lift of your isomorphisms to the chain level in a way that sheds light on the exterior product structure on um, the exterior algebra of the homology? So let's, um, let's maybe save that for the end since algebra has never been my strong point. And there's also not sort of an algebra on ECH. There's not a product structure on ECH as far as I think anyone is aware of. And so it's a little bit hard to know what the right interpretation of the sort of algebra on the right hand side of the equation to what one might hope there would be an ECH on the left hand side. But I'm pretty sure that no one has much hope that there's a algebra structure on ECH and I'll let Michael chime in if he feels otherwise. Okay. okay, so let's try, I don't know an algebra structure on ECH in general. Yeah, so it might, you might be able to get something kind of stupid here just because you do, yeah, there, there might be something kind of not that um, meaningful because it wouldn't generalize or it might just be kind of like a freaky side thing. Okay. Using a weird, okay. Okay, and then Michael says that there might be a nice algebra structure on ECH of this particular example for some reason, but Morgan and I haven't gotten to that point yet because we thought it was more exciting to think about U maps than it was to think about algebra. Okay, so let's do some analysis. Well, this is like analysis light because it's a slide talk. Um, oh, we'll get to cobordisms in a sec, but that's kind of, that becomes very complicated very quickly because cobordism maps do not behave well in ECH. And actually to do this direct limit argument, you have to appeal to the isomorphism with cyborg witten in order to actually recover ECH. So we'll see a little bit more of that in the upcoming slides. 
So um, before we start talking about ECH, um, and sort of we know that the chain complex there is um, consists of pseudo-holomorphic or your differential counts pseudo-holomorphic currents, which are interpolating between rib orbit sets. Let's just first think about cylinders. So I thought about cylinders a lot for my PhD and also as a postdoc, and so I feel good about cylinders. So pseudo-holomorphic cylinders um, on the bundle are gonna correspond to floor trajectories on the base. And here you have to use some intersection theory that's kind of akin to what Seifring did, but Seifring was originally just looking at um, sort of trivial S1 bundles. And so Marino um, made some improvements and he has some great results in his thesis, but then also a side thing that you can port from his thesis is to actually give a proof that um, the pseudo-holomorphic cylinders are exactly in correspondence to floor trajectories on the base. And then um, we know that FLIR trajectories on the base correspond to Morse flows going back to FLIR. And then there's a very nice paper by Zalman and Zander. And then uh, I think Chris Wendell also has a kind of summary of these earlier results in his uh, symplectic field theory notes. And then um, what's nice about cylinders is that you have sort of really nice index calculations and iteration formulas for cylinders solely in symplectizations that um, permit you to use a fiberwise S1 invariant J, even for multiply covered cylinders. And you'll be able to appeal to automatic transversality to guarantee that those cylinders are still cut out transversely. But this ability to use a S1 invariant J is really important because that's going to allow us to relate these cylinder counts to the Morse flow lines, but um, we're not going to be able to use a fiberwise S1 invariant J to look at the more general curves or currents that ECH would count. And so we'll see that in the next slide and we'll actually have to appeal to sort of domain dependent almost complex structures if we want to sort of understand how to count the moduli space. So um, a theorem that I proved in 2017. So just to kind of show you the difference between having a chain complex where the differential is just counts of cylinders versus counts of sort of currents with which are disjoint unions of pseudo-holomorphic curves with an arbitrary of punctures at the top, the bottom with genus and all that, um, is that if you look at the cylindrical contact um, homology chain complex, your differential is just cylinders. The chain complex is a little bit different because you allow for our elliptic orbits as well as all of their iterates to be counted as separate generators. Then you also get to keep all of the um, positive hyperbolic orbits and all of their iterates. And then you get to keep um, just the odd covers of um, negative hyperbolic orbits because the even covers of negative hyperbolic orbits are called bad. Okay, anyway, so it turns out that the Cylindrical contact homology chain complex of a prequantization bundle over the base is generated by infinitely many copies of the Morse complex of the base. And on each copy, the cylindrical differential agrees with the Morse differential. So this is just kind of supposed to show you that if you can reduce it to kind of cylinder counting, then you're in business. And it's kind of uh, somewhat magical that um, the ECH differential only sees cylinders. So what is kind of the difficulty in looking at higher genus curves and counting um, moduli spaces of higher genus curves? And so Ferris explained all of this in his thesis. Um, he set up kind of the formalism to actually understand how to compute the, the uh, ECH differential. So um, the upshot is that we can count cylinders using the lift of the S1 invariant lift of a complex structure on the base basically because of sort of automatic transversality and index reasons. Um, and then the, these S1 invariant um, Js, those holomorphic cylinders correspond to Morse trajectories on the base by sort of going through Merino, Seifring, and um, then also Fleur and Zander, and Fleur, Zander, and Zalman. But the issue is that we can't use this S1 invariant J for higher genus um, curves. And the sort of reason for that is that um, that's not going to be a generic J. And in particular, you can't sort of independently perturb it at the intersection points of the projection of your pseudo-holomorphic curve to the um, contact manifold with a given S1 orbit by an S1 invariant perturbation. So there's just not enough space for you to sort of like perturb your J if you restrict to S1 invariant um, perturbations. 
So the upshot is that that tells us that this S1 invariant almost complex structure, which, very, which is very natural to sort of try to use, is not typically going to be regular. We're not really going to be able to check or not if it's regular, and we won't expect it to. And um, it, we do know that there's always going to be a regular J for moduli spaces of higher genus curves. But we're not going to be able to assume that the generic J that we picked to guarantee um, regularity is actually S1 invariant. And so that kind of leads us to some difficulties because curve counting is no longer going to be obvious um, when we're trying to actually see what the ECH differential is. So the idea is that um, we will introduce, a we'll use a domain dependent almost complex structure and then that way it can be S1 invariant but there's sort of by using the domain dependent perturbation that gives us enough regularity and so these ideas were um, you see them show up in Hamiltonian Fleur theory, and then they were adapted um, by Tillybach and Monka to consider sort of other Fleur-like theories. And so this is kind of the, the starting point for why you might try to um, uh, look at moduli spaces using a domain-dependent J. And then what's going to be nice is that um, if you use a small sort of domain-dependent perturbation, and it turns out that you had an S1 invariant J, which is regular, you could use the implicit function theorem to relate the counts of nearby moduli spaces. So if you do, for some reason, end up having a regular S1 invariant J, you would be okay, and you would know that morally the count should be the same. Um, and then what's going to be sort of the saving grace is that we'll see that using this S1 invariant domain-dependent perturbation, that higher genus curves and multiply covered cylinders do not contribute to the differential. And sort of the sketch of the proof there is that transversality guarantees that our index one holomorphic curves do not exist unless they are fixed by the S1 action, because otherwise the curve would live in a moduli space of dimension at least two. But the differential is supposed to count curves where the projection of the curve to the contact manifold is isolated. So that tells us that we're only going to be counting cylinders which project to Fleur trajectories. And the kind of remaining issue is that Hutching set up ECH with a domain independent J. So we're going to have to relate these counts using this S1 invariant domain dependent perturbation to an arbitrary generic J. And we have no sort of guarantee that this generic J we picked is S1 invariant. So we're not going to be able to just rely on the implicit function theorem. We're actually going to have to look at a one parameter family of J's which go from this um, S1 invariant domain dependent perturbation to just a random regular lambda compatible J. So um, the idea is sort of similar to, or I'm, what do I want to say? So the idea is not exactly similar to sort of the chain homotopy or the chain map stuff in um, Hamiltonian Fleur theory, but some of the ideas pop up. And so we're going to be looking at a one parameter family of S1 invariant domain dependent almost complex structures in the symplectization. So we're not going to look at a cobordism. We're just going to be looking at a symplectization and looking at a one parameter family on the symplectization. The starting point of this um, family is a domain dependent S1 invariant J. And then the ending point is just going to be some random J. So here, um, it's going to be generic. It might not necessarily be sort of S1 invariant. And then the key lemma is that for generic paths, this moduli space is going to be cut out transversely. Um, when we look at isolated um, J's in this family, except for um, sort of a discrete number of these J's. And that's sort of similar to what you see in the chain map and the chain homotopy where you get contributions coming from this sort of discrete number of times where transversality fails. And then um, you can analyze what's going on at um, sort of the failure of transversality. And at each of these um, times, you can show that the differential can change either by a creation or destruction of a pair of opposite sign curves. And we actually don't have to show that they have opposite signs because they come in pairs and we're counting Z mod two. We just know that they don't contribute or there's something called an ECH handle slide. So you don't want to think of like a handle slide. Um, let me, 
uh, let, uh, let me come back to Chris's question in just a sec. So the handle slide that we're doing, you don't want to think of sort of like the geometric intuition from Morse theory because you would technically be doing a handle slide on some infinite dimensional loop space, but it's a hand, it's called a handle slide because um, the differential is not uh, affected. So you may be changing the chain complex, but as soon as you pass to the homology, you don't see a change. And so that's why it's called a handle slide. And Chris asks, is J1 arbitrary and generic here, or is it in any sense close to J not? So in some parts of the argument, J1 is gonna be arbitrary and generic, and then other sort of parts of the argument, um, you end up using uh, a J1, which is close to J0 in some sense. Okay. So then everyone, and then you're happy because it turns out that even though you don't have transversality at this discrete number of times, your homology at the end of the day is unaffected. Okay, so, oh, and Vinny asked about the UMAP. So for the UMAP, we cannot um, use the domain dependent almost complex structure, that sort of approach is not gonna work. And instead to do the UMAP, you actually want to count meromorphic sections and Morgan will touch on that in just a sec. And we're running a little bit out of time. So let me just say a few words about what's going on with this handle slide. So at a handle slide, you're gonna have some sequence of Fredholm index one curves and they can break into a building. So the limiting configuration is gonna be some j holomorphic curve building. And you'll have an index one curve, which can either appear at the top or the bottom. You'll have an index zero curve, which can appear at either the bottom or the top. And here when I say index and I don't specify Fredholm or ECH index, it turns out that C1 is ECH and Fredholm index one and C0 is ECH and Fredholm index zero. And then we're gonna have branch covers that live in the middle um, of a trivial cylinder which have uh, Fred Holm index zero. And so here's kind of a schematic picture where I've got an index one curve at the top, an index zero curve at the bottom, and then I'm gonna have to figure out how to insert some uh, branched cover of a trivial cylinder. And so that looks a little bit like um, obstruction bundle gluing. And one of the sort of key um, lemmas to prove is that branched covers cannot appear at the topmost or bottommost level when we look at this um, compactification of this sequence of curves. And to do that, you have to do um, sort of index calculations, intersection theory arguments that Hutchings and I did in 2016. And then you also have to look at higher asymptotics. And that has um, been done by Christopher Gardner, Hutchings, and Zhang. And um, they're trying to prove something different. But um, they, so I think Dan has the preprint available on his website, but it's not like so it's not on the archive yet, but it is on Dan's website. And they have um, the sort of higher asymptotic um, expansion that you need to look at sort of the intersection properties. And then you can invoke obstruction bundle gluing. And that's um, where this G term comes in and you're doing some kind of magic with induction and um, domain dependent, almost complex structures and stuff and the obstruction bundle gluing tells you that this uh, count for G is some integer and it's gonna be finite and it's gonna be based on the partitions at the negative infinity ends of your topmost level and then the positive infinity ends of your bottommost level. And so that's very um, similar to the uh, what's considered when you're trying to prove that the ECH differential squares to zero, but we're in kind of even more luck because you don't actually have to explicitly compute what the um, obstruction bundle gluing coefficient would be because inductively and using sort of the domain dependence, you can actually show that um, the count of moduli spaces that you would multiply this gluing coefficient by is always gonna be zero. Okay, so now I'm gonna hand it over to Morgan to say a bit about the filtrations, and then she'll go and talk about kind of the interesting work that will come after this. Okay, so we have told you how we can compute something from uh, sort of capped action generators. So, um, you know, the generators of some perturbation where the action is at most some, some level that we've decided on. Um, and the reason why we're doing this is there isn't any 
So the contact forms that we're starting out with, these pre colonization bundle forms, are more spots. So they live in, well, I mean, they live in a, in a big generate family that covers the whole contact manifold, but there's no real method, like a geometric more spot method to deal with this in ECH um, yet. And so we're going to instead consider um, these groups, ECH, L, Y, Lambda, Epsilon, Gamma, which is the homology of the chain complex of where you just consider ECH generators with total action less than or equal to L. And it turns out this is independent of J. Um, and that is shown in this paper by Hutchings and Tobbs from 2013, Arnold Cord Conjecture 2, uh, where they construct cobordism maps which um, and inclusion maps on these chain complexes, which in a very, this is a very simple case. Um, there's a trivial cobordism when you decrease epsilon. Um, and so those cobordism maps give you the horizontal arrows, as Joe is showing you, and then the decrease epsilon, and then the just standard inclusion maps um, give you the vertical arrows as you uh, increase L. Sorry, I think, I, so you're decreasing epsilon going horizontally, increasing L going vertically. And so now um, it makes sense to construct a directed system where you're both increasing L and decreasing epsilon. And we've hopefully convinced you that this um, direct limit on the left is the same thing as the exterior algebra on the right. And so now what we have to do is show that the left-hand side is actually the ECH that we're looking for. Um, and so to do that, we don't actually use these, um, this, uh, cobordism, these cobordism maps um, in, in this uh, commutative diagram. We need to switch over to Cyber-Gwitten floor homology um, and simplify everything there um, in order to actually show that the limit is uh, the ECH when you use. Um, so, so, so the issue, I mean, so all of these ECHs should be the same, shouldn't depend on epsilon because of invariance. But the thing is maybe, you know, there's some piece that depends on these long orbits above the tori, uh, or sorry, in, in the tori above the orbits of your perturbation. And that, you know, maybe because we're using very similar perturbations all the time, this piece persists and stays there um, in the ECH, in the direct limit. Uh, and, but maybe it shouldn't be there in the, in the actual ECH of, um, of the pre-quantization form. Um, but it turns out that that's not true because the cyber and floor homology is sort of more, there, there's sort of more perturbations available to you on that side. And so you can use the isomorphism with ECH, um, sort, sort of a, a filtered version of the isomorphism with ECH in this hutchings Tobbs paper to show that what you um, get in the end is actually the, after computing this direct limit is actually the ECH of the pre quantization bundle. Um, so what we're hoping to do uh, next is characterize the UMAP. So in uh, ECH and cyber Witten and hagard fleur uh, homologies, there's a degree minus two map on the chain complex, and it counts J holomorphic curves passing through a chosen base point. Um, and yeah, so it, under the isomorphisms of cyber Witten fleur homology and hagard fleur homology, um, it's equivalent to the UMAPs there. So we, we hope, so in um, the ECH lecture notes, there's an example of computing the UMAP on an ellipsoid, on the boundary of an ellipsoid with a very small perturbation. Um, and so the UMAP in that case is characterized as a count of index two Morse flow lines from the maximum to the minimum um, of the perturbation. Um, and also sections, so you think of Y, of R cross Y as a C star bundle, right? Because Y is a circle bundle cross R. Um, over the base. And so we expect this to generalize. And why would we like to do this? So U is very useful. Um, one thing, one use of U is just to find index two holomorphic curves because U is an invariant. If the U map is non-zero, then that means you have an index two holomorphic curve. So this was used, um, for example, in the proof by Christopher Gardner, Hutchings, and uh, Homer Liano of, um, the uh, non uh, for non degenerate contact forms, uh, two or infinitely that there have to be either two or infinitely many ray orbits. Um, the next potential use is the UAP is required to construct what's called the ECH capacities, which are a sequence of symplectic capacities which obstruct embeddings of symplectic manifolds with contact boundary. So we could obstruct embeddings of manifolds with pre quantization bundle boundaries. And then the last um, is 
proving a stabilization result. So that's explained on the next slide. So um, it might be familiar from cyber Witten or Hagar Fleur homologies that U is an isomorphism if the grading is large enough. And so if you sort of work through the index formula, um, that means that the ECH groups are all isomorphic to when uh, the grading is large enough and uh, the Euler number is minus one to Z mod two to the two to the two G minus one. Uh, when, when G is greater than one. And if G is one, um, then it's just Z mod two to the one. And that's, that's uh, proved uh, in other places. Um, and U is also the isomorphism. Um, but we would like to prove this theorem entirely in ECH. So that's a, a future goal. And then finally, um, if you start with the periodic mapping class element and you construct an open book decomposition, um, and take the contact uh, structure that's supported by that open book decomposition um, with page sigma and monodromy, your um, periodic mapping class element, so some power of it is the identity, then you're going to get a Seifert fiber space over the orbifold sigma g mod phi. And the contact form, um, a, there is a contact form that shows you that this contact structure is supported by this open book um, and that ray vector field is tangent to the fibers. Of, um, of your Seifert fiber space. So our goal is to generalize these, our methods to circle bundles over orbifolds, aka Seifert fiber spaces, to understand the dynamics of various symplectomorphisms which are freely homotopic to periodic ones. So the homotopy can um, move the boundary. And that is related to some work I did in my thesis. Um, and the reason why this could be uh, a good place to go next is because um, is because uh, mapping classes on genus zero surfaces are all periodic. Um, so periodic just means that some iterate is the identity up to boundary parallel Dane twists. So if there's only boundary, no topology, then um, every mapping class is periodic. Um, and genus zero open books are fairly plentiful. So we're interested in those. All right, uh, that's all, thank you. Okay, so yeah, let's thank the speaker for the very nice talk. Uh, so usually we have a maybe 10 to 15 minute discussion section and then after that we can have a longer informal discussion if, if uh, anyone's still interested. So uh, are there any, any questions? So it looks like Mohammed has a question. Do you want to just Unmute yourself. Uh, so oh, in the main yeah. theorem, on the left, on the, on the ECH side, you take all the possible ECHs for all the spins, whatever, for all the classes, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Right. So where is this in the right-hand side? Like if- Oh, like, if you go um, back another few slides, uh, here. So you're not gonna get every, um, every star at the, every exterior power. You're only going to get um, those that are sort of equivalent mod uh, minus E to the class you started with. I think I see, but I don't completely see because um, originally gamma was like in H1 and now gamma is a number or? Yeah, so, yeah, so, so the rave- that I'm missing. Yeah, um, so I, I didn't, we didn't put this on the slide, I just said it. Um, the ray orbits are only going to live in classes that are multiples of fibers. And okay. so, um, or, or at least the ones that we're interested in, right? The ones above critical points. And so um, once you, uh, if your Euler number is E, then once you iterate a fiber minus E times, you're back to the zero homology class. So we're just sort of abusing notation and thinking of gamma as a number between zero and minus e minus one. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, but I guess maybe um, something to say is that uh, you would sort of expect when you when e is greater than or sorry less than minus one, you kind of expect that all the like when you change gamma for for everything to sort of stay the same. It, like you don't really expect the ECHs to differ that much based on gamma. And there could be, there, the, on the homology level, there could be other things that are different.
And so what's the expectation in this, in the sort of general cipher fiber case? Would it, would you, would you get sort of a similar isomorphism with like exterior algebra of like orbifold cohomology of the base or? Yeah, so part of the, we started to try to do it for cipher fiber spaces and realized that we weren't quite experts at orbifold cohomology and that um, things were already pretty complicated in unraveling how to kind of make a lot of Ferris's constructions precise. But yeah, the idea is that you would kind of see some contribution in some cases coming from the sort of orbifold cohomology points. And that might be um, kind of more expressed in terms of the uh, the gamma, the splitting, because um, you'll have sort of different um, free homotopy classes for your rave orbits, depending on sort of the orbifold points on the base. And you would be putting a Morse function on the base, which is invariant under the um, group action that generates the orbifold on the base. And Michael says that he hopes for the ciphered fiber space, you'd see the symmetric products of the orbifold cohomology. See any other questions for the speakers? Yeah, yeah. The um, the periodicity should follow from the index computations. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the UMAP is going to be a separate paper. <laughs> okay, and Hero has long questions, but they're too long to type out. Should we let the people who don't, who are less of an ECH enthusiast depart for like a more ECH enthusiast special conversation? Sure, so why don't we, um... Why don't we thank the speakers again, and then I'll, I'll turn off the recording, and we can go to the, the informal uh, section. OK. Oh, yeah, and the interesting thing, thanks, Michael, for saying this. I for, We forgot to say this, but the UMAP should look especially interesting for the cipher fiber spaces, because it should count some sort of orbifold gromov witten invariance of the base. And that was another um, fun thing that uh, Morgan and I have to learn about. Oh, yeah, I was planning to say that. Yeah, thanks. Okay.